Bryce Courtney, how's your health? Uh, what, nearly 80? I suppose as good as you could hope for, but I, about a year ago I had an operation and had two-thirds of my stomach removed with a dreaded C, and um, it has its moments, but no, I'm fine, I, honestly. I've just had a, my first year and a bit approval and there's nothing coming back so far. So how has your life changed since your cancer diagnosis? Nothing really changed except that I I didn't get a book out last year because I didn't have time. And and that changed and, and then I was horrified because I've written 20 books in 21 years and suddenly it's now two years and uh, there'll be a book out hopefully this Christmas but I missed a year. How has it changed your perspective, if it has at all? I've had the most astonishingly fortunate life. I mean, it didn't start all that well. You know, I started as a very young kid. I think I was placed in the first orphanage that I was placed in at three months. And although I was relatively young, about seven when I finally came out, um... It was a fairly tough beginning. Those seven years are very important to a child's life. And and I've just been so hugely fortunate since then. But you've talked about how much you want to achieve in the time that you do have left. I, I, I try to live every day, although it's difficult as a writer because you've got to, you know, I write 12 hours a day. So I have to get up pretty early to have any extracurricular life. I'm a fanatical gardener. I like the arts enormously so I things have to be packed in very hard and very tightly um, and and so your life is so full that you haven't got time to think about when's it going to end and everything you know everything has a use by date you know I I, I got the, the clearance as, as the other day from from my doctor and and On the plane to Sydney, I had made up this poem because I thought it was going to be bad news because I'd been getting these bad, what I thought was stomach cramps, but in fact turned out to be diverticulitis. Uh, And and I'd made up this this little poem on on the plane which said something like, there's a time to live and there's a time to die, there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry, there's a time to love and there's a time to hate, but we all have a use by date. So how has all of this affected your writing? You said that you didn't put out a Christmas book, which was the first time in a long time that you didn't do that. Well, virtually the first time, really. Uh, no, the second time. The first time I built a house instead. But, uh, but um, yeah, it, it's disappointing because, because, as I say, you do have a use-by date, and I had to postpone my so-called storytelling or writing career for the 27 years that my my son was alive, um, so so in essence, I had a lot of making up to do, and and I guess I've got 27 books. I mean, I'm totally thought about that, and I'm only on 21, so maybe maybe I've got a bit more time, but I doubt if I've got seven years, Karina. You mentioned your grueling schedule. You write for 12 hours, six days a week, for seven months a year. How do you maintain such a schedule? In part, desperation. I mean, when you are a storyteller, and that's all I am, and and uh, the stories just have to come out. Now, in researching for this interview, I came across a couple of references likening you to Charles Dickens. What do you make of that comparison? Well, I was teased on Dickens. I fell in love with his way of telling stories, and before I was 11... I'd read everything Dickens had written. And so people have constantly said, but you write as if you are a modern-day Dickens. Wow, what a compliment. It's not true because I could never have that kind of talent. But but at least he was a consummate storyteller. And that's what I see myself as, Karina, is somebody who tells our stories and tells them set within an accurate historical perspective. Uh, So that if people read one of my books... They are, they are actually reading correct history. The only thing that it's invented, in a sense, is, is my character and his or her movements within that landscape. But I take a great deal of trouble to get it right, get the feeling, the sensibility of 
what my beloved country is all about, which is Australia, of course. Let's talk about the power of one for a moment, which yeah. is about your homeland, yeah. South Africa. That book has sold 8 million copies worldwide. Yeah. You've changed the literary scene in Australia, haven't you? Well, that's a lovely thing to say, but uh, I'm sure my critics wouldn't say that. <laughs> or would have certainly not change it for the better. How much of your life is in your books? I, I think inevitably a writer is an observer and, and an experiencer. If I experience something, I can then translate it and I can give it a gender. It doesn't have to be masculine. I can say, how would that experience work in a female? Uh, and I can reproduce it. And uh, for me, dialogue is critical. I can almost, uh, half an hour with anybody, and I almost tell them, they tell their life history. Let's talk about writing April Fool's Day. You've said that that was mm. the hardest thing you've ever had to do. Well, if I had to do another April Fool's Day, I wouldn't. I, I, that would be a permanent gardener from that moment on. No, too hard. But Just, you did it because your son Damon asked you to. Very reluctantly, Karina. very reluctantly. I mean, I, I mean this, this is pathetic, I know, but, but Damon was five foot ten and a half or something like that, and, and he weighed 47 pounds. What's that? About 19 kilo or something. And, and, and I had him in my arms knowing he was going to die that day. And he said, Dad, got to, you've got to tell the world that AIDS isn't a punishment from God, it's just a virus and you've got to tell them and I said, oh, Damon, I can't, you know, our family is too private, I don't want the world to know this, this particular story, not about AIDS, it just, it means we have to be absolutely truthful about everything and, and, and our family is so private, your mother's private and I bring your brothers into it, he said, please dad, he said, I'll even let you sing Summertime. Now, Karina, I have to tell you that I never, because I got beaten so often as a child, I never even even entered my head to lay a hand on any of my kids. And and so I would say to them, when they were bad, I'll sing you Summertime. And they'd say, no, 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 Dad, anything but Summertime. We promise to be good. And he said, I'll even let you sing Summertime. Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Your daddy's rich and your mama's good looking. So hush, little baby, don't you cry. One of these mornings, you're gonna rise up singing. Then you'll spread your wings and you'll reach for the sky. But until that time, why nothing can harm you. Cause daddy and mommy are standing by. And he died in my arms. And I had to write April Fool's Day. Forgive me for that, mm, Pauling boys. The, some of his other last words in the book, uh, promise me, Dad, that you'll always look after Celeste, whom I love very much, much more than my own dumb life. What's your relationship like with Celeste now? Uh, it, it's, it's curious, and I have no idea why. I mean, in a recent program, Celeste evinced to my astonishment that um, that she wished that I hadn't written April Fool's Day or words to that effect and um, it was very hard for me to comprehend because of course she saw every page when I was writing it but it doesn't mean I don't love her, I absolutely adore her. There was a section in the book that she narrated herself. Oh yes, absolutely. I mean she was privy to the book entirely. There was no, uh, there was nothing clandestine about it. And she, along with some other people who are close to you, have said that you might have bent the truth about aspects of your life story. 
That's private stuff, Danny. I, I don't go there. Um, and, and you learn very along the way just not to comment. So, so I, I wouldn't comment about that at all. Has it not been hurtful to you? It's always hurtful. But you know better than to comment because that just exacerbates everything. But there are some serious claims there that they've made. Do you, you have an opportunity, a right of reply? You don't want to address those? I'm a writer. I have all the material I can ever want and, 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 and put it all down and, and unquestionably will. I've learned a great deal from it. I've learned a great deal from their comments. Um, dare I say, curious as this may seem, whilst it hurt deeply, it was also very useful stuff. 